Well, thank you for all being here. We're going to look at the hazards, both onshore and offshore, for Southern California. And before I start, I'd like to recognize the team that was assembled. And this team is second to none. Um, Graham Kent is the co-leader here. So I'm going to do the green here to locate you, because it's not so bright when I come into the screen. Graham Kent is the state seismologist for Nevada. He's also the director of the Seismological Research Center there. He used to be here at UC San Diego before they pried him away. So he is a world-leading expert in seismology, geophysics, understanding faults. Steve Wisnowski, who's also on this team, Steve is actually the one that put together a lot of the empirical data on earthquakes and stepovers. So as faults have segments, they have stepovers to adjacent faults. So we'll talk about that tonight. And he came up with relationships that would tell us whether an earthquake could rupture from one fault segment to another or whether it would be arrested. And this is really important because seismic moment scales to the area of the fault, the, the length of the fault. Others here, Jane Borman, these are all professors and scientists at various universities. Valerie's at, up at University of Oregon. Here, Jillian is a professor at San Diego State. Jane Borman is a professor at State University at Long Beach. So this team are all experts at looking at geophysical data, looking at fault segments, fault set, step overs, and this team's second to none. And so um, I just want to acknowledge their efforts in this. So here's the outline for tonight. First, we're going to assess alternative models for the Oceanside blind thrust. So it has been purported that there's a large thrust fault that dips gently at about 23 degrees that goes underneath the entire coast of Southern California, okay, with a large area in the seismogenic zone. The seismogenic zone is the zone that supports stress. It's strong. The plates move. It builds up stress. And when the stress exceeds the strength of the rocks, they fail. Okay. We're going to test between these two models and try to understand which one is more consistent with the observations. We're that next going to look at the Newport Englewood Rose Canyon Fault and characterize its geometry, its segment lengths, its stepovers. And then we can put that into an earthquake calculation, not a model an earthquake calculation based on empirical data and based on first principles of seismic moment. These are equations. Okay. Okay. The data just, you'll see how we use the rupture length or the area to calculate the, the credible earthquake, potential earthquake. We're then going to talk about tsunami hazards. And one thing, I'd like to point out to you is there's near field and far field tsunami hazards. Far field is like when the earthquake, like the 1964 Alaskan 9.2 earthquake on Good Friday, that would be a far, for, far field source. The tsunami would travel large distances before it arrived at our coast. The near field tsunami is one that's triggered by faults close by or by rapidly accelerating underwater landslides. Then I'm going to talk to you about something that's become a, a hazard that has the greatest recurrence interval. It's happening almost every year, 365. In fact, we just detected a fire in Hemet yesterday. All right? So even in conditions of low fire hazard, we're still having these fires. And the third week of October seems to be our bewitching hour, the 2003, the 2007 fires the cedar and witch fire, when the temperatures are in triple digits, humidity is in single digits, and the Santa Ana wind is blowing. These are ripe conditions for extreme firestorms. What are we doing about it? How can we get early detection? How can we get situational awareness? How can we put our firefighters and first responders in safer conditions with knowledge? I'll walk through how we do that. Finally, I'll talk about preparedness for hazards in Southern California. And I was delighted to find today that the city of Oceanside has got one of the best 
sites and information about hazards I've seen for all of Southern California. So kudos to the Oceanside Fire Department and the warning sheets and preparedness because they're excellent. Okay. So now I'm going to give an executive summary. So those of you that want to get back to the market, buy some fruits, vegetables, or go home early and watch the football game, okay? You can leave after the executive summary and have the punchline, okay? So here we go. So here, this is the purported Oceanside Blind Thrust. Okay, so this is a seismic profile. I'll talk about what this is later and go through this in more detail. But the results of the seismic research performed offshore here shows that the predictions of this Oceanside blind thrust are not observed. Okay. And in science, when the predictions of a hypothesis are not observed, you have to either reject the hypothesis or change it. So here, without the Oceanside blind thrust, there'll be no potential hanging wall effects, and I'll discuss in detail what these are. And the tsunamogenic hazards will be less because in a thrust fault, there's a large vertical component. And if we have a large vertical component underwater, it's gonna displace the water. And if it happens rapidly, then this can engender a tsunami. So we find no evidence that supports the existence of the ocean side blind thrust. We have a very significant fault system offshore, the Newport Englewood Rose Canyon Fault. Our work has shown that the segments, okay, there's four segments and three stepovers, that the stepovers are all two kilometers or less. And therefore, a rupture that starts on the southern segment will not be arrested and could propagate all the way to the northern segment. And if it does that, it would propagate from La Jolla all the way up onshore into southern LA. Okay. This could generate a magnitude 7.4 earthquake. This would be the sixth largest earthquake in the history of California. This would be a significant event. We don't have to inflate the hazard because this is hazardous. A 7.4 earthquake is a significant hazard. Don't underestimate this. Okay. Be prepared. Right. Tsunami hazard. As I told you, there's far field tsunamis, like with the 1960 Chilean 9.5 magnitude earthquake. When that wave, which is going at plane speeds through the deep ocean, approaches our shoreline, there are regular topography, Tanner Bank, Cortez Bank, Bishop Rock, these shoals cause the waves to slow down and build amplitude, but then they go into the San Diego trough, which is deep, about 1,200 meters. The wave collapses, so the wave builds again, collapses, builds again, so we dissipate the energy in the offshore regions, and these act as a natural baffle to far-field earthquakes. Near-field earthquakes, due to faults that have a dip-slip component close to our margin, or that can cause underwater slides that accelerate, could cause a near-field tsunami. If you're at the beach and you feel the ground shake, leave the beach and seek higher ground. And Oceanside has these evacuation placards and how you escape to get to higher grounds. If you see the water recede rapidly, leave the beach. This is a sign of a near-field tsunami. So education and preparedness is how we deal with these hazards. We want, as a society, to be prepared and work from knowledge and allow the data to inform us of what the hazards are. The largest historical tsunami wave height in California was in 1868, 4.5 meters in the San Francisco Bay region. The largest tsunami reported historically in Southern California, south of Point Conception, is with the 1812 earthquake, the one that toppled San Juan Capistrano mission. The size of the tsunami was 3.4 meters. Okay. So this gives you some time, but 3.4 meters, remember tsunamis, 
the waves keep coming. It's not just one wave. So if you're warned to get off the beach, you feel shaking or you see the water recede, do not go back to the beach until you're told so by people that can officially tell you it's safe. Okay. All right. Early fire detection. This is the Whittier fire that happened this summer. This is up in Santa Inez, our camera's right here. It almost burnt our camera. I'll show you testimonials by fire chiefs that talk to how these cameras are game changers. They're 4K resolution, they're pan tilt zoom. So the fire departments have the capability of scanning with these cameras and looking for fires, okay? It provides unparalleled resolution to capture this early ignition. We could have captured the early ignition of the Cedar Fire in 03 or the Witch Fire in 07. We would have had a better chance for evacuation, better chance for fire suppression, marshal our resources. Chief Fennessy from the Monta Vista Dispatch said that these are game changers. He was able to look at the fire on his laptop, look at the smoke, look at the weather, and he knew how many battalions and tankers he had to send there and airdrops, and he knew how long they'd be there because he has the rest of the county to take care of also. Game changer was what Chief Fennessy said. Okay, so let's start off and just talk about the largest worldwide historic earthquakes. These earthquakes all occur on the ring of fire where I have subduction of the plate underneath another plate. And I get volcanic activity in the overriding plate because the water that goes down with this slab reduces the melting temperature of the overlying rock and we create volcanoes. So that's why it's called the ring of fire where I have these subduction style margins where the plate is going back down and recycled into the earth. I dewater it and the overriding plate melts and creates volcanic eruptions. Mount St. Helens. So here, largest known historic earthquake, the Chilean earthquake in 1960, magnitude 9.5, large tsunami in Hawaii, in Hilo. Many people died. We didn't have the Pacific tsunami warning system in place at this time. Followed by the 1964 magnitude 9.2, the Good Friday earthquake in Alaska. Again, huge energy release, magnitude nines. These are subduction zones where the plates are recycled back into the earth. After these two earthquakes and others, scientists, we decided to build an early tsunami warning system. Unfortunately, we didn't have one in the Indian Ocean. So here, the Sumatra 2004 Boxing Day, December 26th, magnitude 9.1 to 9.3, over 200,000 people lost their lives because of the tsunami. <sighs> Devastating, All right? So just large loss of life because they, we had no early warning. So these margins, what I'd like you to realize is these margins are subduction margins. Our margin here in California is what we call a transform margin. So there, the plates go down back into the earth, and there's a lot of friction and force required to do that. And when the rocks rupture, they release a lot of energy. Transform margins, or what we call strike-slip margins, the plates move by one another, okay? And there's much less vertical motion with these faults, and the earthquakes are much lower. Let's look at this. Let's look at our earthquakes here, the largest ones in California. So here, let's start with the Fort Tejon earthquake, 1857. 7.9. This is a large, large earthquake. Okay. Fortunately, nobody lived out here at the time. So the amount of death and destruction was low. Okay. So remember where earthquakes hit dictates a lot of the human loss and loss of infrastructure. 
The rupture length of Fort Tejan was 400 kilometers long. Okay? 400 kilometers. Then we look at the Lone Pine earthquake, 1872. It's estimated by its rupture patterns that it was about a 7.6 or higher, maybe even up to a 7.9. Death toll is higher because there was more people in Lone Pine. Four to five meters of vertical displacement. 10 to 15 meters of lateral displacement. This really moved the plates. And remember, the equation I'm going to show you is seismic moment is related to the shear modulus, the displacement, and the area of the fault. Lastly, the 1906, the San Francisco earthquake. Rupture length of up to 480 kilometers. Okay, so what we look here, magnitude 7.8. So the largest historic earthquakes in California are in the high sevens. And they ruptured long distances, two on the San Andreas, one on the Sierra Frontal Fault. Had large displacements, large surface rupture. Hey, we have much infrastructure here on the coast. If you look at LA, San Diego, and Tijuana, our cousins to the south, this is probably one of the most densely populated coastlines in America. Okay. So we have much interest in what hazards exist here and how we prepare for them. Okay. So what I'm going to show you here is this is based on 1.8 billion pixels, little pieces of information that was run on a San Diego supercomputer SCEC, Southern California Earthquake Center, was involved, UCSD. This is the California Great Shakeout. Remember, drop, cover, hold on. I already know where I'm going to be at if the earthquake happens during this talk. I'm going to be under this podium. I would advise you, any building or room that you enter, ever, you think about what would you do if an earthquake happened right now? Where would I go? Do not try to run outside. 7.4, it'll be difficult to run, okay? Laptops are really good. I would probably put my laptop over my head and crawl under this podium. And I wouldn't come out till the shaking stopped, okay? But I always look around to see what's overhead. And at, at your house, please don't have any pictures over your bed. Um, Everybody have a pair of shoes by their bed. Because most people cut their feet during an earthquake because your belongings fall off the walls and you have shattered glass everywhere. You should try to keep your vehicles at least half full of gas. It's good for the vehicle. It's good for emergencies, fire also. Have cash, right? I'm never able to keep my cash. I have a little plastic uh, bin under my bed and. The cash is always raided by my 20-year-old and 16-year-old getting pizza. But the ATM's not gonna work, right? Infrastructure is gonna be down. Try to think about what you'll need for three to four days to be self-sufficient. Okay, so here we go. This is a magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake. We're gonna rupture from Bombay Beach here all the way up to Lancaster, okay. about 230 kilometer rupture. What I'm going to show you is displacement associated with this rupture. Uh, captures the magnitude of the ground motion, but what I want you to notice is how wide this ground motion is away from the fault. So here we go. So we're going to start the earthquake. Here it goes. Earthquake time is up here in the right corner. The earthquake is propagating northward, white, is not good. That's high displacement. You can see Palm Springs. When you can't read the names of the locations, not good. Okay, so now the earthquake is broken out of where it's rupturing, and these are what we call bow wakes. We've learned from these simulations that uh, direction of rupture is important. We're a minute and a half into the earthquake. Look at LA. LA is ringing like a bowl of jelly. 
All right, so we're now almost moving into like a couple of minutes into this earthquake, all right? And it's just gonna keep going. In LA, it, it has harmonics and it has loose soils and it's a basin and this just keeps ringing, okay? So two minutes of shaking in an earthquake is a scary event and I hope never to experience one, okay? I like the ones where you call your friends and say, did you feel it, all right? I do not wanna be here for a uh, mid seven to high seven earthquake. This is a very significant hazard. But they don't occur very often. Hundreds of years apart, the San Andreas, its recurrence interval is about 175 years. Unfortunately, with the Southern San Andreas Fault, it's been about 325 years since the last rupture. We call this the open period. When the open period is much greater than the recurrence interval, the probability of an earthquake goes up. That we can't predict earthquakes. So that's what we do. So here, with this knowledge that you just gained about displacement with earthquake, we can look at where we live. Here, San Clemente, Catalina, coming in here to Oceanside. What we notice is there's this yellow box here. This is the Coronado Bank Fault Zone. The reason it's depicted as a box is this is a thrust fault that has a dip, a 23 degree dip. The other faults are shown as lines because they're vertical, okay? They don't have a large dip. So here, if we start in the east, this is the San Andreas Fault. This accommodates about half of the displacement between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate being at about 20 to 22 millimeters per year. Moving west, we have the San Jacinto, about 12 to 15 millimeters per year. And as we step west again, we have the Elsinore, about five millimeters per year. The offshore faults, as you can imagine, are less well constrained because we can't trench them, we can't image them as well as we can on land until recently where new seismic approaches and techniques allow us to image the offshore at unprecedented scales. So here, this red fault, the Newport Englewood Rose Canyon fault, where it comes on shore, we have estimates of its slip rate, about 0.5 millimeters per year. This is from Freeman's work and Grant's work. As we come to the south, where the fault goes on shore here at La Jolla Cove, right by the beach and tennis club, we get measurements that are about one and a half to two millimeters per year. And this is coming out of Tom Rockwell's group, okay, who trenched the fault. All right, so here, these are the two faults that are most concerned for here on the coast in Southern California because of their proximity. The San Andreas Fault is too far away. Coronado Bank Fault is not active. Palos Verdes is too far away. This is active. This is moving at about two to three millimeters per year. And we go out here, the San Clemente Fault Zone, we have the San Diego Trough Fault. This is estimated to be moving at about a millimeter per year. We're looking at offset channels and, and bathymetric features that I'll show you. So the two faults that present the largest hazard to us here in Southern California along the coast are the Newport Englewood Rose Canyon Fault that can support up to a 7.4 earthquake or the Oceanside Blind Thrust. So here, let's look at these, just distances. I just wrote these out so you can see the distances from the coast. The two that are closest to us are the Newport Angle that is eight kilometers. <coughs> That's offshore where we are goes onshore in La Jolla and up in LA, Newport, and the hypothesized Oceanside Blind Thrust, which is vertical. It's not away horizontally, where it's beneath us, okay? So the hypothesized Oceanside Blind Thrust is about seven kilometers beneath us here. The Rose Canyon's offshore. Reacquire my microphone. So here, let's just go through and talk about these style of faults. So a blind thrust, here's the fault plane. 
You can see this orange and yellow layers are offset by the fault. In front of the fault, the layers are folded and you make relief. So there's vertical relief, but these are folded, not faulted. Hence the name blind thrust. We do not see manifestation of the fault on the surface. These have large vertical displacements. This is a right lateral fault. You can see the road is displaced. So if you're standing on this block, looking across the fault to this block, it's displaced to the right. It's independent of reference frame. If you're standing on this fault here, on this side, oops, on this side here, and looking across the fault, it's again deflected to your right. This is a right lateral fault. We have left lateral fault. So this is called the right lateral are called dextral, and the left lateral are called sinistral. So here, this is Catalina, sitting right here. These are large mounds offshore. This is the Washwin Knoll, Crespi Knoll. The warm colors are shallow, the cool colors are deep, and these are out to about 1,800 meters water depth. So these features that are observed along the margin have been explained by two different hypotheses. The ocean side blind thrust and a segmented faults with offsets and jogs, and I'll explain to you how that works. So here, in the top panel, I'm showing you like a road cut. This road cut is like if you were driving by and seeing this fault, it would be dipping at 23 degrees. And notice it has large area in the seismogenic zone. The seismogenic zone in this region based on micro seismicity is at about 10 to 15 kilometers deep. On average, about 13, okay? So there's large area that's in the seismic here, the, the layer that's strong. Okay. So when we look here, this is what it looks in map view. Here's the coastline, here's the shallow end of the fault, and here's the deep end of the fault. Okay, and so thrusts that have low angle have a lot of area in the seismogenic zone. The more area in the seismogenic zone, the larger the potential earthquake for a given slide. The other model is this segmented model, and this here is the first map. We're getting ready to submit this paper for publication. It's gone through all the co-authors. It shows the faults and how they link up, and for the first time, we've shown how the San Diego trough links up into the Pedro Basin Fault and up north into the LA region. Red are active faults, yellow and orange are inactive faults. Here's the Palos Verdes. Here's the Newport Englewood. So I just told you that strike slip faults don't have a vertical component. So how do they make this relief that we see on the seafloor if they don't have a vertical component? It works like this. So these faults are segmented. And where they're segmented, there's these step overs. So if I have a right lateral fault, this is moving to the right with respect to this, and I step over to the right, then this piece of block is moving that way, this piece of block is moving that way, I make a hole. I get extension. I have a space problem. Conversely, if I look at these faults, and this here is a right lateral fault now with a left lateral jog, this plate is going north, this plate is going south, they collide there and I have a space problem and I actually build underwater knolls and mounds just like Mount Soledad. Mount Soledad, the fault's running along the five, and it goes down Ardath Road, I mean La Jolla Parkway, there's so many, it's La Jolla Parkway, La Jolla Drive, La Jolla Shores, but the old going down now, which is the La Jolla Parkway, going down that, the fault follows that, and then goes offshore, and there's a big jog, and Mount Soledad is going up two and a half times faster than the regional uplift rate of 0.13 to 0.14. Offshore, it's one of the largest kelp forests in the state because we expose hard Cretaceous rocks that the kelps can grab hold of. Okay, so tectonics in California creates this rich tapestry of geology on the seafloor that engenders different habitats. So here, this model explains the offshore morphology by jogs of segmented faults. 
The other model explains it by splays off the ocean side blind thrust. So in order to test this, we spent 100 days of geophysical collection, probably a little more. We collected bathymetry data shown here, all of these track lines in a 3D volume here, we collected as part of this experiment to characterize the offshore. This is the densest seismic data set ever collected on this margin, and it has really even distribution so we can characterize faults. It has different resolution. We have seismic sections that image the top 50 meters with resolution about a meter, and we have seismic data that images down about five kilometers with resolution about 25 meters. We call this a nested approach because we can look at the faults in the surface, we can estimate offsets, structure, and we can look at them at depth for a bigger structure and how they might coalesce. Okay? So this gives us uh, really an unprecedented scale to classify these faults. So this is our ship. The nice thing is we performed all of this research on Scripps Institution of Oceanography Scripps and our ships, Scripps ships, um, and we fabricated towing harnesses and arrays to make this work. This is a 3D P cable survey off the New Horizon. This is the sound source. These cables each have eight hydrophones. They're 50 meters long. Hydrophone is just something that listens to the pressure wave through water. This seismic source makes the source energy. These are paravanes that keep the array part. We have compasses and GPS instruments so we know accurately where all of these streamers are. And then we can image the seafloor and subseafloor at an unprecedented scale. So I'm going to jump to what the observations are and then we're going to see which hypothesis is more consistent. So here we're going to jump a little bit into the details. So onlapping sequences, these are sequences that if I have a mountain or a slope, they onlap like this and terminate against it. Onlapping sequences and patterns offshore show that any deformation is really old and the deformation becomes younger to the east. Okay, so these are important things to store away as we go through the data. Two, the transport of the Monterey blocks is towards the south, southwest. So we image the Monterey, we see the Monterey at San Onofre State Park. It's really finely laminated sediments formed in deep water, anoxic conditions. We have localized regions of compression and tension. So if you're walking along the plate, this area is in compression, this area is in tension, tension, compression. They're laterally adjacent. And the basin depth increases above the Catalina schist markedly to the south. So there's a southward dip on this plane. It's not just dipping to the east. So here, these offshore observations are not consistent with the ocean side blind thrust, and I'm going to show you why. They are consistent with this segmented. Here we have the segmented faults, shown here in red. Blue are depressions. Mount Soledad, this here is off Torrey Pines pop-up. Okay, Crespi Knoll, Blashwin Knoll, they're where the faults step over. So if I step over to the left, I get uplift. If I step over to the right, I get subsidence. So the observations are consistent with segmented faults with stepovers. So I'm going to show you just one line. Um, I'm going to show you this line here, 4515. This line shows that the movement of the blocks is to the south, not to the west as proposed by the ocean side blind thrust. So let's just look at how we collect seismic data. So seismic data are collected by having a sound source, as I told you, with the energy reflecting off these layers and returning to a cable and being recorded. And we record the times and then with computer processing, we can make images of the seafloor and we can see where areas are faulted. So here, this is a lot to take in, but here I want to orient you. This is to the north, this is to the south, 
This little bar is 1.5 kilometers, and this distance is on the order of a kilometer. I'm showing you the uninterpreted on top, so you can make your own mind up, and the interpreted on the bottom. What I'd like you to notice is there's this low frequency surface that cuts through the data. And on top of it, there are these dipping layers shown here. And these flat lying layers show us there's been little deformation out to the west, and the deformation appears to get younger towards the east. Let's look at a blow up of this. So here, this is again north, south. This blue line is that low amplitude reflector I've talked to you about, but you can actually see the dip of these layers get steeper as I go up section. These blocks are sliding to the south. The blue horizon is not a detachment fault, it's a basement contact with the Catalina schist that most of you have seen here. You can see big blocks of it at Oceanside or up at um, the uh, Institute there at Dana Point. You can also see it on Catalina Island. Okay, so here, let's look at the Oceanside blind thrust. It proposes these features on the seafloor. So here's the main thrust, pushing these blocks to the west. Where we have splays of the fault coming off the master fault, I get fault scarps on the seafloor and relief and erosional cutoff structures. So here, they explain the seafloor morphology by being created by splays off the master fault. So I want you to think about this thrust fault as like a snow plow. The snow here has no idea that the snow plow is coming. And the wedge here builds out and I'm pushing the blocks in the direction of shortening. So in the ocean side blind thrust, I'm pushing the blocks to the west not to the south. Okay. And the deformation should be youngest here to the, to the uh, away from the snow plow and older deformation of recycled snow longer and longer here. So that is the youngest deformation front right there. Okay. We call this the critical taper. When we look at our data and we look at the old data, you can see that you're, you cannot simply take these splays up off. So this, these features are here. You cannot just take these splays off this deeper structure and bring them to the seafloor. These layers are flat and they're undeformed. So they show us that the deformation is old, but the deformation can't be attributed to a blindside thrust or splays off this thrust. So here, based on these observations and the predictions of the ocean side blind thrust, the observations are not consistent, okay, are not consistent with this model of pushing these blocks to the west. Blocks are moving to the south. The blocks of the deformation is getting younger towards the snow plow where it should be getting younger away from the snow plow, okay? The observations are consistent with the segmented strike slip model. And th these results suggest the hazard for the coastal region is reduced by this amount of slip that was purported to be on the ocean side blind thrust because there's no evidence for its existence. We have to reject this hypothesis. There's no observations that are consistent with it. Finally, there'd be no potential hanging wall effects on ground motion or tsunamogenic hazards because this ocean side blind thrust has a much bigger vertical component than with the strike slip models. Okay. All right. So there concludes point one. Point two, architecture of the Newport Englewood Rose Canyon fault. So our data, Our data characterize this fault system, shown here in red. So we have four segments separated by three stepovers. Here, the star shows the 1933 6.4 magnitude earthquake in Long Beach. The last earthquake in the Rose Canyon on trenches down here, 1650, plus or minus about 100 years 
As I told you, the slip rate to the north is 0.5. The slip rate to the south is larger, two millimeters. Some people believe that it's more distributed up here and there's not a clean fault. So that measurements on any single strand will underestimate the slip. So all of the step overs shown here in these yellow boxes are less than two kilometers in width. And from empirical data, the, the width of the step overs is not large enough to arrest rupture from jumping from one fault segment to the other. So here, we used a lot of data in characterizing this. We used CHIRP, which is high resolution that's on near shore. We used Sparker, we used Airgun. Um, we reprocessed data. We've characterized this fault pretty, pretty, pretty well. Unprecedented scale. So now, this is the Torrey Pine step over. So let's use what we've learned. So here, the La Jolla segment is shown in red coming offshore at La Jolla at the Beach and Tennis Club, and it steps to the left here at the Torrey Pines pop-up. We get compression. These are two seismic lines that you're standing right here looking at this intersection. So this line and this line are two separate lines, and we have them so you're looking at them directly. And what you'll notice is the layers are warped up. So here, where we have these jogs to the left on right lateral faults, we actually see pop-up structures. Okay. Right? And this pop-up structure and the offset here, as I told you, is not large enough to arrest propagation of a fault on this segment to the Torrey Pine segment. Let's jump north. Okay, so this here just shows you some of the high resolution, slightly to the north. Okay, 15 meters now here. This is deposits that have been since the last sea level transgression when glaciers melted and the water transgressed across the margin. And what we see here is this is a scarp of the Newport Englewood Rose Canyon Fault, about two meters on the seafloor. You can also see it causes little basins. So this is a little jog now to the right and we get thicker sediment in here where we have no sediment on either side of this basin, and we can see folding and deformation. Continuing northward, I'm now at the Carlsbad Canyon step over. So I have the Torrey Pine segment coming in here, and then I step over to the Carlsbad segment here. You can notice the deformation and folding. Here it's up, here it's down, and here we have sediment on top so it hasn't ruptured to the seafloor. So this is the seafloor on one profile, C4 on the next profile and on the third, and here's the horizontal scales and the vertical scales north is in the arrow direction. Again, we have a left step over. We're getting faulting and jogging, okay? So now let's go to the next step over to the north. So here again, the, shore, the surface of the profile, the C4 is shown in red. And I have three profiles here. Here's the scale bars. And what you'll notice is here, I have the Carlsbad Canyon step over, going over to the Camp Pendleton segment. And I can see again, folding and doming. And it's actually blocked all the sediment. And this area here is the widest part of the shelf because of this step over. Okay, so this is what these step overs look like. In the northern segment, I have two fault strands. I have the Dana Point fault strand here and closer to the outer shelf, so you can notice the change in slope, is the Camp Pendleton segment. So looking at all of these step overs and characterizing them in detail, we notice that the width between them is small. It's smaller than empirical derived ability to jump over. So we can have a fault start here and propagate all the way up into LA. And if we do that, what we do is we calculate, so we, the segment, the scenario two, this here is showing all four segments rupturing. Okay? And when I do that, and I use the empirical wells in Coppersmith, which I'll show you in a minute, I get a 7.3 magnitude earthquake, which is a significant event. Okay, so now, what does the Wells Coppersmith do? 
there's a relationship, an empirical relationship between rupture length and magnitude. And these dotted lines show the 95% confidence interval. And this here shows the regression of that line. So here, when we have a 125 kilometer long fault, if we link up all of the segments offshore, then we get a 7.3 magnitude earthquake. If we link up and do that with the, the seismic moment, so here, this shows slip, 0.5 and 2 to capture variability. This shows the shear modulus, 20 gigapascals versus 45. Okay, and so we're looking at different bounds because the seismic moment is related to the shear modulus, the strength of the rock, the average displacement in the area of rupture that's governed by the seismogenic zone, and the length of the fault. So this is just a, uh, an equation that tells us an estimate of what the seismic moment will be. And in turn, the seismic moment can be related to magnitude by this equation here. So these are just simple equations that relate shear modulus, displacement, and area to earthquakes. Okay. And when we do this and we look at this for an earthquake that ruptures about 158 kilometers, we get magnitudes that are up around 7.4. There's nothing to stop all of the segments from rupturing together, but this would be very rare. We don't see evidence in the onshore and offshore for all of these segments to rupture. The USERF model three shows that rupturing of all of these is, is not likely, but could occur every 13 to 15,000 years. So here, to summarize, there's four main fault strands of the Newport Englewood fault, and they're separated by these three step overs, and they're all two kilometers or less. So faulting will not be arrested. And based on this, rupture characteristics, we could produce an earthquake, credible earthquake, up to 7.3 or 7.4. As I said, the data don't show that this whole segment has ruptured in concert. If this did happen, here's the three lar largest that I showed you, Imperial Valley here has a wide range because of a lot of reworking of the, uh, the rupture, we would be in the top, the top six earthquake ever recorded in California. This would be a significant event. Don't underestimate this. And we don't have to inflate the, the hazard here. This is a significant fault system that could generate a large, credible earthquake. Tsunami hazards. So here, just to locate you, so purple, this pinkish color is the shoreline. This is the Salton Sea trough area. This is in the Gulf of California. This here, we're looking at San Clemente and Catalina, we're right here. And so what we're looking at is this area off Southern California, Point Conception to South, that's on the order of about 250 kilometers wide that has shoals and deeps. And these shoals and deeps, as I told you, act as a natural baffle to far field tsunamis. So here, this is just looking, here's Catalina. We're looking from the west to the east. La Jolla Canyon here to reference yourself. These bathymetry shoals and deeps acts as a natural baffle to incoming tsunamis. The large tsunamis are caused on margins that have subduction, as shown here, where one plate is subducted beneath the other. So as in between earthquakes, we're building up stress, we're building up deformation, then it's released. It's released rapidly. And when it's released, this generates a pulse in the water. And the water then moves at airplane speeds in deep water, and this creates the large tsunamis. We're not in this style of margin. So here, what we want to look for is evidence for slides or scars or blocks that are evidence for past tsunamis. Okay, so here, this is off Santa Barbara. This is the Goleta slide. Notice the scale here. You can see the slide blocks. This is the Gaviota slide. You can actually see a little crack here. Warm colors are shallow. 
deep colors are, or cool colors are deep. This is about 500 meters. You can notice that this slide didn't go very far. So this is probably not tsunamogenic. It just kind of probably burped. And I can show you seismic data that supports that if we want to talk about that in the question period. The Goleta slide here had blocks that moved down, but they didn't move very far. This could have created, some people have hypothesized that this was created during the 1812 earthquake. and could have created the 3.4 meter tsunami observed in Santa Barbara. This is Lake Tahoe. This is McKinney Bay. Here's the scale, two and a half kilometers. These blocks are about a kilometer across and they fail down into the basin. So Tahoe Basin is about 500 meters deep, 500 plus. And so these blocks here skidded out and skidded down into Lake Tahoe and some of them went pretty far. All right, so there's just a battalion, a marta of blocks out here that are large. Again, warm colors are shallow, deep colors are shown here, and cool, or cool colors are deep. And so this is what we'd look for offshore in our bathymetry data if we wanted to find evidence for past large landslides that could be tsunamogenic. This is off Oahu, the Nuhaani landslide. Notice this, this is 50 kilometers. These blocks, some of them are 25 kilometers in width. 25 kilometer blocks skidding down the slope. So imagine you're in the bathtub and your son comes in with a cinder block and drops it in. Water's gonna go everywhere, okay? These are big potential tsunamogenic generators. The ones that move slowly, imagine you just put the block in slowly, there's not gonna be a big wave. So the acceleration of these slides is critical to whether they're tsunamogenic. This is the largest underwater slide we know of. It's off Norway, it's called the Storiega slide. Notice this, this is now 100 kilometers. The amount of material liberated by the slide is 2,000 times larger than the 1980 Mount St. Helens. This caused tsunamis that were on the order of 15 to 20 meters in, in the local islands off Norway and England. The average height was about eight to 10 meters. But this was one of the largest underwater slides that liberated more material than any other slide we know of. So when we come back and we look at our area, we have the La Jolla Canyon here, Carlsbad, Oceanside, Newport, San Gabriel. This block is caused by a jog in the faults, as is the Crespi Knoll. We don't have evidence of these huge blocks offshore in either the bathymetry or the stratigraphy. Okay. Does that mean they can't happen? No, but they haven't happened frequently or in the data sets we have. And the largest tsunami, as I told you, in Southern California that's been recorded historically is 3.4 meters Santa Barbara. So I just want to leave you with the borderlands, which is this area of shoaling and deepening due to the tearing apart of the California margin has made the margin really wide off Southern California. And this width in shoals and deeps acts as a natural baffle to far field tsunamis. Okay. Near field tsunamis, we don't have evidence for really large landslides or large blocks. So the, the Goleta slide that I showed you up north is one of the big scars that we do have in this area and a candidate for the 1812 tsunami. Okay, so here, I just want to jump into fires a little bit and what we're doing. So this is the 2003 Cedar Fire. The outline of the fire here is shown in red. This is the Paradise Fire in Valley Center. The amazing thing is this fire was consuming 4,000 acres an hour. Okay. It jumped all the lanes of the 15 down by Miramar was started by a, a hunter who was lost and um, in the Cleveland National Forest and the rate of consumption caught everyone off guard. Well, almost to the day, four years to the day, third week in October, okay, along comes the witch fire, the outline shown here in red. 
This is the city of San Diego with the dust and, and smoke from the fire in the background. Okay. Burnt 240,000 acres. So what have we done? Well, we've partnered with SDG&E, University of Nevada, Reno, University of California, San Diego, and we've built these camera systems. So these arrows are all cameras on mountaintops. And this camera is the one we're looking at, looking to the east, so you can see here the eastern trajectory. You can all log on to these cameras at alertwildfire.org. The nice thing is with these cameras, you can zoom. So here is El Capitan Reservoir back here. They can image up to 75 miles. So here, we're looking at a blow up of El Capitan Reservoir from that camera. Okay, so we can look at these and we're tied in with Cal Fire, San Diego Fire, and they have access to the cameras and the sheriff. So they can pan, tilt, zoom these 4K cameras. They can also time lapse them. So when you get on this website, if you left click, if you're a PCer, or you control click if you're a macker, then you can get time lapse here, okay? And you can look at the fire through time. And you can see the fire dynamics. We can take this information and we can put it into fire models that are dependent on topography, fuel, wind conditions, humidity. And we can make predictions about where the fire is going to go and how fast we need to respond. We have eyes on you guys. Here's our camera looking down onto Oceanside. You can go to all these cameras. You can zoom. You can do time lapse. Okay? You can see where the cameras are pointing. I'm going to take you now over here to Mount Woodson and show you how we're looking at you from the other angle. Okay? So we're checking out fires in your area. And we're tied in to all the emergency first responders, Monta Vista Fire and Rescue, Dispatch. And what we can do is we can actually blow it up and we can look and see where we see smoke. We're developing machine vision so we can detect smoke and infrared uh, heat automatically and, it, and it, they're alerted at the station. But during these weeks in October, we man these cameras 24 seven because that's, that's the firestorm time. And I, I was up weekend, last weekend, looking at the fire damage up north and the Tubbs fire and looking at Coffee Park, 1,000 houses just leveled. So we're putting cameras up there. We want early warning. We want situational awareness. We don't ever want to have the fire greet us at the front door. We want time to evacuate. So here, this was a control burn that we caught on Tuesday. We contacted Cal Fire. Here's the camera looking out at it. So this is Valley Center. Fires in here, huge, huge fuel problem. This was a control burn, nice to know. Okay, so we, we're all checking in. So when we see these things, we can check in, okay? This was yesterday. This is a fire, this is Hemet. This was a fire we discovered in Hemet. We're able to get rapid response to get it out. So even though it wasn't peak fire conditions, we still have fires here. And we want, we want to try to get early detection, situational awareness. We can also, by clicking here, when you get on the website, clicking this Chevron tag, you can then get the azimuth of the cameras and you can triangulate cameras to see where the fires are. And it will give you streets. These maps are really detailed. You can zoom in, get streets, lat long, and you can convey that to first responders and firefighters. So these cameras have uh, really been a godsend, game changer. As I told you, Chief Brian Fennessy is it, just using these CAL FIRE. It allows for quick response, better response strategies, faster evacuation, orders to ensure our communities are better prepared in the face of wildfire. Some of these are also going to have on the way we got into this was we were looking to develop a microwave network that wasn't tell, tied to cell phones that fail in an emergency. We're gonna have strong motion seismometers. 
early earthquake warning. We also have moisture sensors on these for early flood warning. Okay. So what happened up at the Feather River okay, and the Oroville Dam, they didn't have eyes on that. They had to have a helicopter zoom over. They now have a dam cam. Okay. So the Whittier fire, same thing. Tom Gardner just said we could watch our hotshot crew and make sure they were safe and they could actually assess how drops were affecting the fire. Okay. I can't explain how valuable these cameras are. And our goal is in the next five to six years, we'll have these cameras everywhere. Somebody, man, talked to me about, you know, when he says, somebody says, I'm not here with my hand out, he feels like his wallet's being taken from him. But we've funded this on a novel approach of private sector and academia. So we won't be coming to Oceanside for funding for this. We'll provide these cameras for Oceanside. This is the wildfire, okay? Look at the cyclonic activity in front of the fire. The data from these cameras are actually going into fire models. They make their own weather. We don't want our firefighters caught off guard because regional weather conditions aren't capturing what's happening on the ground. Okay, just, uh, just watching this is frightening. My house, 03 and 07, we were evacuated and it went right up 07, right up Rio Rancho Parkway, Del Dios burnt, houses just popping off. Okay. All right, so here, be prepared. Okay. These are some of the best uh, warning sites and prepared sites. And here, listing here that with many studies, the credible large earthquake that could be supported on the Rose Canyon 7-2. They also discussed the movie I showed you of trying to understand uh, rupture length, earthquake magnitude, and ground motion and displacement. Disaster preparedness. All of these sites tell you about make a plan, get a kit. Fire, have defensible space around your house if you're on that rural urban interface. Okay, stay informed. Okay, so here, one of the things, Skek has a great earthquake warning. One of the things I just want to bring up is we all talk about preparedness, but we also have to survive and recover. And it's that survive and recover that's really hard. Okay, that three to five days without power, without water. Okay, so. Have a plan, have food, have water, have a plan how you're gonna communicate, reconnect, right? Resiliency, tsunamis, these are a real threat. They're very finite, they're rare, but if you see the water recede or the beach start, you feel an earthquake, it's time to get to higher ground, okay? Move quickly. If you see the water go out, you usually have about two to five minutes before the tsunami hits. Wildland fire, will you be prepared? So you wanna, you wanna make sure that you have protectable space. The fire department will tell you if it's a choice between your house and your house and one has no protectable space, they're gonna go to that one first. They'll tell you this, protectable space around your house. Okay. Food supplies. Right. So here, just there's many of these websites. I've just listed a few here to make a wildlife plan, prepare your home and make it safe. And so as I'm taking questions, this is the Whittier fire that almost burnt our camera. I'll be happy to take questions and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Neil. And I'm going to ask a, a, a few. Uh, there was a few questions about San Onofre, which I will actually pass on to the CEP and Edison. But I'm going to ask the questions that actually pertain to this presentation. Can the Newport Inglewood fault support an 8.2 earthquake? That was one of the things that were brought up before that I've had emails on. So here, uh, I want you to see this infrared. But as I told you, the largest earthquakes in California have been seven, 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 eight. 
and the rupture lengths have been 480, 400 kilometers. The length of the fault here is not long enough to support such a large earthquake. So if you look at the length of the fault and you connect up the offshore segments and the southern onshore segment, you're in around 160 kilometers. Okay, so based on data and good characterization of the faults, a 7.3, 7.4 is what we calculate. But that's going to be rare too because we don't see all of the fault segments rupturing together. And as you move north, the faults are segmented. They're not well connected. So the data we have shows that an 8.2 is extremely unlikely to be supported by this fault structure. Thank you. Could you discuss the Christianitos fault? Is it an active fault? So I have some slides queued up for that, but the Christianitas fault is not active. It's not in the USERF 3 model, which is the universe, uh, Uniform California Earthquake Rupture Forecast model. It's not in the California Geological Survey. And the reason it's not is this, is when we look at this fault in our research, we've mapped it offshore. So here, so here, this is the Christianitas Fault. Okay, so the Christianitas Fault, if you've gone down Trail 1, San Onofre State Park, you'll see it cutting across and separating the Monterey from the San Mateo. So it's separating rocks. So the colors here show the rocks that are exposed in the cliffs. Monterey here to the south, San Mateo to the north. The fault comes down like this. And if you look at offshore data, this is a seismic profile, and before I just want to show you, it's back up here. All of these lines are data that we collected on this margin to characterize here the margin morphology and these fault systems. And if you look, our data shows that the Christianitas fault has folds and deformation. We believe it's a strike slip fault with a dip slip component down to the northwest. It was previously interpreted as just a normal fault. But if you can look at these layers here, these layers in blue, magenta, my student loves this color. Not so much. And the yellow, all of these layers postate this high because they pinch out non-lap, but they feel that morphology. So, and if we look on land, this is here. Synthetic faults, faults that are parallel to the Christianitos. This is the alluvium, San Mateo. This is the Bay Point abrasive lag. And if we move over here and look at an old photograph, um, this is uh, from Glazner. What we notice is the faults right here. This is the Monterey. This is the San Mateo. This is the uh, Bay Point abrasion platform, and it's not offset. And this has been dated by uranium thorium on corals, and it's dated back to 125,000 years ago. Our data suggests it might have moved a little younger, about 80,000 years ago. And here, these are two graduate students enjoying themselves in the field. Here's the fault, here's the San Mateo, here's the Monterey. Bay Point is not offset, and you can see this. You can go up and make this observation. So it hasn't offset this deposit that's anywhere from 80 to 125,000 years old. Okay? And so when you look at the California Division of Mines and Geology, or you look at the California Geological Survey, if it hasn't moved in the last 10 to 11,000 years, it's inactive. Our data offshore, the data onshore, previous studies by Schlemann, McNay, Klotzko show that this, this hasn't moved in the last 120,000 years. McNay on onshore trenches says it probably hasn't moved for the last 500,000 years. So the Christianitas fault, the fault in the area, but it's not active, and that's why it's not on the fault forecast models that we use to estimate hazard here in California. Oh. Okay, could you discuss how helium could lubricate the fault would it make the, the earthquake larger? Helium has been, so that we have helium-3 and helium-4. And the difference is uh, an extra neutron. 
And so what happens is in the mantle, we have helium-3 in the atmosphere, it's lighter, and it's been able to escape. So we look at helium-3, helium-4 ratios to understand deep sources of magma or fluids, but the parts, the concentrations of these helium in these wells is parts per billion. It, it can't lubricate a fault. It's a gas. Gases are compressible. So here, the concept that helium lubricates a fault and makes the fault larger, okay, it, 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 a gases don't lubricate faults, but let's just say they did. If I lubricate a fault, I lower the shear modulus, I decrease the size of the earthquake. So you can't have it both ways. You can't have something lubricate the fault and make the fault larger, okay? So I would tell you that helium is used as a tracer to look at deep fluids from the mantle because we can look at ratios of helium-3 to helium-4, but they don't lubricate faults. Okay, thank you. With a 7.4 offshore quake, the damage to the coastal bluffs, to what extent would that happen? And this is like no, that's local a, that's, that's liquefaction, landslides, and how would you prepare if you lived on one of our bluffs? That's a really good question. So um, I did a stay vacation with my uh, family last Thanksgiving. I I'm your neighbor inland, live in Escondido, and I live on a mountain. So I get to see the fires come right at me, but we stayed in Solana Beach, right on the water. And I looked over the cliff off the patio and steep cliffs, they're almost vertical in places. So these cliffs and uh, the shoreline deposits, you can imagine that weaknesses, ground shaking, there's gonna be failures. And you, armoring is, is now very difficult because of the California Coastal Commission, but planting indigenous vegetation and building up root structures and trying to have vegetation hold the soils more stably is one of the best options you have. But in an earthquake, these coastal bluffs are going to experience erosion and they're going to experience shaking. And you can, if you're a homeowner that lives on the bluffs, um, I'm jealous. They're beautiful, but they are precarious. And, and you knew that, you know, um, buying these properties and earthquakes will cause enhanced slope failures along those cliffs. And you can just look at the cracks and crevices and places where it's sliding to get an estimate of where places might be more susceptible. Thanks. So you talked about moving to higher ground, how much safer and how far inland. So what would be kind of your estimate if we had, I guess, worst case scenario, how far inland should we? The try nice thing is a lot of our shoreline, we have lagoons, estuaries, but very close by we have relief that we can get up on the order of 10 meters very quickly. So I would, I would say that I would, I would probably stop at 10 to 20 meters just to be safe and then wait till you get information by fire, first responders, police to go back down to the beach. So um, I would go up 10 meters. Okay, thanks. So do uplifts and downdrops of the stepovers cause tsunamis? These are usually um, a longer time phenomenon, but um, they don't move fast enough. So the way a tsunami, so here, we learned this in the 1929 Grand Banks earthquake. So we had a large earthquake off of the Grand Banks and it triggered an underwater landslide that snapped successive cables that we use for communication to Europe. And we were able to assess that the flow velocity was 100 kilometers per hour underwater, all right? You can't get funded to do this experiment because you'd have no equipment after the experiment, right? I'll be gone in the underwater landslide. So we have very few data points, but this 1929 Grand Banks earthquake and tsunami and slide left 51 people in Newfoundland, they lost their lives. So it's the speed at which the tsunami or slide deposit accelerates that's most important 
for the magnitude of the tsunami. And I showed you that the Gaviota slide just burped and didn't go very far. Goleta went farther and had blocks and could have triggered a, the 3.4, but it's the speed of these and the runouts and these pull apart basins and pop ups occur on millimeters per year. They're geologic scale features and time, not rapid. Okay, thanks. Can you explain the relationship between slip rate and the probability and strength of a, of a quake? So here, as I told you, the San Andreas has larger slip rates on the order of 20, 22 millimeters per year. So what happens is you get more frequent earthquakes because you're sliding the rocks and at locking points, you're building up that stress. So when you build up that stress, then you can rupture. And the thing that's governing how large they can be is the step overs that can permit through going or arrest these ruptures. So there's two things at play. There's one that there's more earthquakes on high slip faults, but their magnitudes are dictated by connectivity of the segments and how far that rupture can propagate, as well as the seismogenic zone. How deep is the seismogenic zone of the zone that can support stress? Okay. Is there a correlation between hot, well, temperature and an earthquake about to happen? So, I guess heating of the Earth's crust. Well, one of the things that we're very surprised about is we thought with the San Andreas that when we measured in around the San Andreas with uh, probes, thermal probes, that it'd be hotter. And it's actually cooler than we thought it would be. So that was kind of a, a hmm. And fluids seem to play a big role. These faults, when they rupture, they have permeability structures. With continued fluid flow, they can seize up. So often these faults are cooler than what we think they are for moving and rupture and friction. Okay? And fluids play a large, so that's a complicated question that would change based on fluid flow, where you are in the fault system, and, and how permeable the fault system was. Okay, hopefully I get this question right because there's some technical language that I, I'm not sure. So in 2017, a Scripps PhD recipient documented transgressional nature of offshore faulting Given his work, what are the odds of the next quake being on a new fault east of the Rose Canyon Fault? Well, um, Jane Borman has done a study that's shown that faults to the west of the Rose Canyon Fault are active. Coronado Fault is inactive. Palos Verdes to the north is active. So there's patterns of these faults. And when you say, what's the likelihood of it rupturing on a new fault, um, we're looking in the USERF model and trying to understand the balance of deformation. And so here, we're using fault systems that we know are active, and we're using how the deformation, this 50 millimeters per year, is displaced or uh, distributed on these fault systems. So um, it, it's hard to make that prediction. Okay, thanks. So uh, just to follow up on that then, what, what determines the destructiveness of a tsunami being near origin or distant origin? So here, uh, tsunamis, uh, the force of water and the material they contain in them uh, is very destructive to structures, people, so everything gets caught up in the tsunami. And there's usually multiple wave fronts and so it, it just keeps coming. And it, you know, some people joke and say, well, I just surfed the tsunami. Well, it's not a surf wave. It, it's more like a bore or a, a wave that has lots of energy and uh, lots of uh, weight. And it's usually the destructiveness of what's in it pushing into existing structures or crushing you against something else that's not movable. Okay. I, again, this one's a little bit complicated. Dr. Pat Abbott from SDSU in his book about geologic history of Oceanside pointed out there were mountains to our west and our geologic features are relatively new. You said that these features are old in geologic terms. What is, what, what's the difference? Well, the peninsula ranges are 
these granitic cord mountains that are slightly inboard. And they have mafic enclaves. And the relief of Mount Soledad is relatively young. It's going up because of the jog and the fault. But a lot of these features are tens, 20, 30 million years old. So in Pat Abbott's book, The Rise and Fall of San Diego, um, some of the structures that he's referring to that are young are slides like at Echo Canyon or uplift of Mount Soledad, but the peninsula ranges are associated when the margin used to be subduction oriented. And a lot of the conglomerate, Pat Abbott was one of the first people that looked at the Poway conglomerate that comes from Sonora, Mexico. And he used this as a piercing point. So here, here's the Sonora volcanics in Mexico. And here we see them here today. And so what we know is that the plate has moved so far. So Pat Abbott was one of the first people that did some really uh, competent work that, that added to our understanding of how much displacement had occurred on the California margin. OK. Uh, to, to refer to your infrared cameras, would they be sense enough to locate hikers or campers who are, are lost? I mean, yeah, because you said you like infrared, and, and that so, was, so that's, yes, that's the I, I haven't. We, um, I'll give you an example. Um, a couple of years ago, there was an arsonist up at Lake Tahoe lighting fires, and they were trying to catch him with the infrared cameras and see if they could see the arsonist before he escaped, but they never caught him. But yes, we, um, if you look at the Mount Woodson camera, you'll see people hiking. And so they're that resolution. So on the cameras, certain ones, you'll see that we've blacked out some of the vision so that you can't look at people's houses and so forth. So we've tried to make the cameras so they uh, honor privacy, but also give us early detection. OK, this is the last question. Uh, the, the other questions aren't really pertinent to this um, presentation. And there are, some of these are San Onofre. As a member of the CEP, I will forward those on to Edison, and we'll okay. get those answered. But the, the one question was, who funded this organized visit today? Who um, funded an organized visit? And I can answer this one, because this presentation came out of he and I and George Murray sharing a bottle of wine at Beach House Winery. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, it was uh, early summer midsummer yeah, and yeah. we were talking about this and he said you know all this information you have it would be great to present it to the citizens of Oceanside since we live along the coast so nobody paid him here today except the guy that really funded everything was George because he had the wine so well you know <laughs> um, just to add on to that is a lot of times we answer to the squeaky wheel and not the people that really want to be informed and understand what the data tell us. So this was an opportunity that we discussed that said, we'd like to make people aware of what data are out there and how they inform us about hazards so that you can see how we do this. And there is uncertainty, okay? And there's scientific debate and discovery, but we have to stay within the bounds of the data and we don't want to inflate the hazards. They're serious enough already, and we don't need them to be inflated more or have uh, earthquakes that are, would be the largest in the state that will most likely occur on the San Andreas be proposed to happen here offshore. It, it's not supported by the fault architecture, the fault length, and the fault character. So I speak to you today within the bounds of data. Okay? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about these hazards, but I think that if we're prepared, not scared, that we're going to make it through these, but we don't need to, to escalate or, or promote fear. Right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>